Perfect. So I guess I'll take things over. So welcome, Abby and Rich. Good to meet again. We've hung out in person a few times. Now we get to do a virtual hang. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> I'm great. Uh, yeah, I'm dialing in from Porto in Portugal uh, today. It's been a busy few weeks, I think, like with, with the market changing and sentiment turning and, and Bitcoin being the hottest asset back to, you know, where it belongs. Uh, all eyes on Bitcoin. And uh, I was just, you know, as we were discussing earlier, I was in ETH Denver last week, but it wasn't about ETH as much as it was about Bitcoin. Should have been called Bitcoin Denver, but it was it was great. Um, yeah, and things have been going great at Pith as well. You know, we are uh, delivering on a lot of our promise from last year, integrating with new exciting ecosystems such as Core and uh, working with developers across, you know, various teams uh, trying to promote DeFi everywhere. So, yeah. On to you, Rich. Yes. Thanks. Uh, yeah, coming here from, from Puerto Rico, uh, super excited. Uh, the developments in the Bitcoin ecosystem, I think, are most excited I've been since 2013, probably. We really kind of shot ourselves in the foot in the 2017 cycle. So it's great to be hot again. It was definitely, you know, Bitcoin Denver uh, a couple of weeks ago. Met so many amazing teams. Was really fortunate to be part of the, the Bitcoin Renaissance event, which probably had the best excitement of any Bitcoin event I've seen in a long time. And I think that Bitcoin is going to lead the way this cycle in terms of uh, 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 interesting technology that, that comes out as we try to separate the asset from the rails. So I met, I don't know, 30 different Bitcoin L2s, all sorts of interesting scaling solutions. Like it's a great time to be in the Bitcoin space. Totally. And you know what? Like Bitcoin's always been a store of value. We've always seen it as digital gold. Um, it has some usage as peer to peer, uh, you know, transaction for peer to peer transactions. But finally, we are unlocking its true potential, in my opinion. Um, with, with the smart contract functionality coming on top, you're able to unlock all this nascent or passive uh, value, which is just there. And, and maybe some don't agree, but there are some who do want to unlock and you know use their assets in, in innovative ways. And I think that's what this new wave of innovation is unlocking. Um, and you guys are at the forefront of it. So very exciting times, very excited to see what's coming next and, and you know, how this all plays out. But it is definitely positive in, in every way possible. Totally. Yeah, the, the one piece, and I'll hand it back off to, to Brendan, is, is like when you talk about digital gold, you remember back to the original white paper of Bitcoin, it was supposed to be better money. But due to some of the limitations of actually scaling Bitcoin, we've never been able to fully realize that. And using scaling solutions like Core, we actually now have that opportunity to be able to realize kind of the second half of that vision. Digital gold is amazing and it's, it's a fantastic now $1.5 trillion of you know, stored asset value. But there's just so much more Bitcoin can be where it's the hardest money we'll, we'll probably ever know. So I'm excited to jump into that. And uh, I think there was a bit of lag on my end. So you guys can hear me OK? I think we were jump, jumping into things, but yeah, I think these are all the uh, topics we wanted to jump into. Uh, There's obviously a ton of excitement at ETH Denver last week, which both Abby and Rich uh, alluded to. We we got the the pleasure of all hanging out e at each other at Bitcoin Renaissance and a few of the other events. Um, and then Core just came out with this exciting, uh, you know, white paper, uh, not necessarily a white paper, but a paper about B BTC Five called uh, unlocking Bitcoin DeFi.com. So it's uh, a long thorough read, a lot of work was put into it. Uh, we're really proud of, of that uh, paper and just wanted to kind of jam a bit on what it means and kind of this new exciting uh, opportunity that's happening with Bitcoin. And we brought on Abby, who's uh, with Pith. We'd love to get a bit of an intro and then we could dive into some of the questions here. But one of the ecosystem partners uh, from Pith they're doing a lot of amazing things. Would love to get an intro from you, Abhi, and then we can dive into some of the topics here on BTC5. Perfect. Thank you, Brandon. Um, so I'm head of business development at Duro Labs. Duro Labs is a contributor to the PIT protocol. Um, I was earlier with the PIT Association, so I've been involved with the PIT project for more than two years now. And um, as part of my you know, mandate or my kind of focus area is all about finding the next partnership or the next innovation 
which Pith as a protocol should be focusing on. Um, and that is how me and Rich connected a few months ago. And, you know, the journey has been exciting, but I think now is the time when we really step it up a notch and um, leverage all the developments and the hard work which you guys have put into core. Um, I think now is the time when that will bear fruit. Thanks, Abhi. And then we've got Rich uh, from Core. I don't know, Rich, you want to maybe give a bit of your background for, for the audience, although I'm sure you uh, they already know you pretty well. Yeah, I think people are probably getting pretty sick of uh, seeing my face. Uh, <laughs> but but no, on a, on a serious note. Um, so I'm Rich. Uh, I've been with the Core team since, since the beginning, really trying to help kind of build out the organization and then a lot of the product development pieces, trying to really get kind of the closest aligned chain to Bitcoin and as, as Brendan kind of mentioned it, we're doing a lot of work and trying to unlock, you know, Bitcoin DeFi. And it's a big focus for us, not just this year, but for the next several years, because we think this is the story of the whole next cycle. Prior to core, I led money movements engineering at Coinbase for three and a half years. That was a lot of fun. I'm a zero to one guy, so Coinbase got too big for me, but I, I met a lot of amazing people and have a lot of great war stories. Prior to that, a bunch of other crypto projects and startups. So it's been a, it's been a journey. Love it. Great, great backgrounds there. And uh, if you don't know, I'm Brendan also contributing on the core project in a variety of ways, but uh, we'll focus on these two to start. I'm just going to help facilitate uh, some of the topics today. So um, we've been talking about unlocking Bitcoin DeFi or BTC Fi, uh, which is, uh, you know, not, another way you're, you're seeing that all over Twitter. And, and we've talked a bit about that at core. So I guess we could start by just saying or talking about what is BTC Fi, what's Bitcoin DeFi, and what's this kind of new narrative or new excitement that's come to to Bitcoin, this new age of Bitcoin. Yeah, so so I'm happy to to field this one, um, and, and I think it's important to, to take like a step back when people are trying to define uh, BTC Fi and realize that Bitcoiners aren't one homogenous group. Like there's a lot of very different viewpoints out there in, in the Bitcoin sphere. And if we try to loop too many people into one thing, we wind up with kind of this zealotry and all the infighting that Bitcoin and you know, many crypto like, uh, crypto projects are you know, uh, overtly known for. And, and I think that's a really important framing to use because of that, it allows you to view the full spectrum of what BTC Fi can be. And for some people, that's going to be non-custodial staking, like what comes out here in April on core, which is just passive yield. You never leave the, the Bitcoin chain. And that's a totally fine stopping point. Bitcoin becomes a productive asset for the first time, and you get to earn yield without ever giving up custody or your keys, which is so important to so many Bitcoin holders. For other folks, you'll want to move slightly down the, the risk curve, and you'll want to engage in maybe pretty safe lending protocols like a Bitcoin make or die and that sort of thing that gives you leverage or potential, uh, you know, your Aves of the world, like your kind of, um, your, your pretty milk toast like DeFi products, but are very interesting and are very useful kind of building blocks for any sort of, uh, of DeFi ecosystem. And then for other folks, you'll go further down the risk curve and you'll be, you know, taking out, you know, levered positions against your ordinals and, you know, doing you know, 5X uh, perp trades and your BRC20 tokens. So for every one of those people, you need to kind of have some different home and some different offering. And Core is trying to be the home for, for all of these different folks. It is why there's such a broad variety of offerings and many more to come. Yeah, and to add to that, Rich, I mean, Bitcoin, as you said, started off as better money or, or a replacement for the existing financial system. Then somewhere along the line, you know, people forgot what is the functionalities which are required in a financial ecosystem. So you need a, a, a framework for investments. You need a framework for borrowings and savings. You need a framework for leverage. You need a favorite framework for debt. All of that was then solved by other ecosystems. Started with Ethereum, with the whole smart contract, you know, functionality, and others have built upon it: Solana, Aptos, Sui, and now others. But having, you know, ordinals and BRC20 tokens and the whole inscription movement on Bitcoin, I think, made people realize that whatever is happening with other ecosystems is possible in the, in the true original OG Bitcoin ecosystem itself. We don't need a um, hundred different, you know, kind of flavors when the original flavor can cater to everyone. So that's, I think, what we're going back to kind of the true north, which was Bitcoin, which is the 
true money, the you know the strongest money, the ultrasound money. I know the ETH community uses that, but Bitcoin was the original ultrasound money. So we're kind of moving back to the true north, and we are bringing all this functionality, or let's say the learnings from other ecosystems, back to Bitcoin, and really, really making it a colorful ecosystem. And I do agree, agree with you that the community is so large that not everybody wants DeFi or not everybody wants NFTs, but some do. Some want the NFTs, some want the DeFi, and we need a platform which brings them all together and serves everybody. So and I think I think that's that that resonates with me, like what you just mentioned. That's really great. As well said, I like the as a original Canadian, I like the true north reference that is embedded. I, I love the true north, but yeah, the North North Star. But uh, yeah, you kind of alluded to it, Abi, around what kicked this off? Like, why is this the time uh, for, for BTC Phi? You know, like Bitcoin's been out for quite some time now. I think you alluded to some of the ordinals pieces, but yeah, I would kind of, try, I don't know if there's anything else you guys want to add, but what really kicked off this almost next phase or, or kind of excitement that, you know, didn't seem real even a couple of years ago? Yeah, I think like some... <clears throat> some of the team like Taproot Visits, right? They, they, the, the whole inscription movement, they took a risk. They went against popular opinion, um, but kicked off things which became like an avalanche in the sense that you've got uh, BRC20 tokens, you've got ordinals, you've got now NFTs. And some of them actually, by the way, are performing way better than any ETH collection. Like they have floor prices close to one BTC now. So there's a lot of organic interest from people who were, I would say, forced to go to other ecosystems, but were still Bitcoin native or still Bitcoin holders. And they came back when they saw similar kind of activities uh, and interests being catered to within the Bitcoin community. The final trigger, I think, without doubt, in my opinion, has been institutional participation today, where you had the NFTs, you had the inscriptions, and you had a lot of like communities built around it, but all of a sudden you have institutional participation in Bitcoin. And I work with a lot of institutions, uh, you know, at Duro. And what we've realized is institutional involvement in crypto starts at Bitcoin, at ends at Bitcoin. The ETH is way is very risky for them, and don't even talk about other assets in their portfolio. So you have the ETF movement, which finally culminated in approval, a lot of institutions, Bitcoin was legitimized with the ETF approval in the US. Everybody now feels very happy and comfortable owning Bitcoin, being involved in Bitcoin. And that I think is going, is the next trigger for Bitcoin DeFi. So I, I, I kind of, I think it's all fallen into place in a great kind of, you know, timely fashion. But the NFTs, the ordinals, the inscriptions were at a different time span and have different triggers. It's just a very nice coincidence that they picked up right when ETFs were picking up. And now you have DeFi powered with institutions, which is, I, I would say, the next driver of growth for the Bitcoin community. It's like a perfect storm. I was going to say, it's, re it's really hard to top that answer. I'll just add just like, <laughs> may, 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 maybe yeah. a couple like a couple pieces on top. Um, so I think there, there's kind of two categories uh, on top of institutions that have really come into it. And, and Abby really kind of hit on the head. One was these like ETH ecosystem participants who were like former Bitcoiners or people that had to move to other chains to kind of go get some of this utility. But I think the potentially the more exciting group is actually the latent Bitcoiners. It's the people that have been waiting to participate just using Bitcoin, either because they've got opposing views of other chains or they just haven't felt safe or able to go participate. And I think if you look at some of the, the more Eastern audience, uh, there's been so much participation in ordinals and BRC20s because you can finally use your Bitcoin to go participate in these ecosystems for the first time. And that was just a, a massive unlock. And I think we've also seen kind of going back to some of the OG Bitcoin uh, era ethos, where inscriptions mints are almost like a perfectly decentralized ICO. And that's really powerful because we've seen so much kind of bad behavior and insiderism in so many of these chain launches. Also why Core did a fair launch because we've seen so much bad behavior and seeing the ability to go participate in these like totally egalitarian mints 
has really opened up the, this new wave of interest. And I actually expect to see this get way crazier uh, as time goes on. We've seen some interesting L2s use ordinals as like bootstrapping mechanisms for TVLs. So for TVL, so th there's really just a whole bunch of interesting stuff to come there. And then having the, the BlackRock bid, of course, is, is really exciting for the space. And I can't wait to see institutional DeFi for the first time really kick off. I think staking will be big for that. And then I think we'll actually see a lot of this trustless lending take off because of how many institutions got burned by Genesis Celsius on top of the retail that got burned as well. But we forget that all parties got hurt in those sorts of things. And it's really DeFi's moment to shine. The boys are bullish. The boys are bullish. I like it. I think that just that kind of has the the great setup because you always wonder why why now. And last week at ETH Denver, it seemed like everything was culminating into something something big here on the Bitcoin side. And uh, that kind of leads to the next question or, or discussion here. There's there's a lot of excitement in BTC Phi and a variety of approaches. And if you read the un unlocking Bitcoin DeFi. Uh, again, unlocking BitcoinDeFi.com paper, great domain, uh, hat tip rich. Um, it it kind of talks about some of the different approaches, right? And it, it's obviously a huge opportunity, but we'd love to get, I mean, we, we don't have endless time here, but would be great to get a, a bit of a rundown of some of the approaches and where core fits. Uh, maybe maybe we could start with rich. Um and yeah, I think I think we saw a few of those last week, and there's just a lot of excitement. So it'd be great to get a rundown. Totally. Uh, so yeah, so the quick synopsis uh, on the paper is Core has a variety of these products that, that, that are coming out on top of the, the base layer to allow Bitcoin DeFi to really you know take place. One of which is non-custodial staking. Then we've got Core BTC that's coming out, which is this over-collateralized lending product. And the other piece that we've announced is the HTLC atomic swaps. So trustlessly being able to exchange value from one chain to another with no intermediaries, getting rid of any centralization risk there. There's a whole bunch of other stuff to come, but those are the pieces we've been out so far. But I think to really kind of like hone in on the point, uh, as you're evaluating you know, different Bitcoin scaling solutions, one of the most important things is the underlying trust assumptions. And one of the biggest things that Bitcoiners care about is making more Bitcoin. And the way that you make more Bitcoin historically is by not giving your Bitcoin to other people. And that's a really important piece. If you look at, again, all these like centralized failures that happened last cycle, I don't think we're going to see a repeat of that, particularly from the Bitcoin side, because people just aren't as yield seeking from a, from a lending perspective. They'd rather get it in trustless ways that are now coming online. And that's really important. And one of the reasons that there are all these different approaches is kind of true to the core ethos of building for all the different Bitcoiners. There's this desire to make sure that you can get to core and, in, in, and participate in this ecosystem in a way that matches your trust assumptions and your risk tolerance. And that's really important. And core is like over the top clear in the trust assumptions that you take on by getting involved in these different things. And you can go from totally trustless to more risk seeking and trust minimized. But the important thing is to have really safe defaults that, that people can appreciate as they go into these ecosystems. And as you look at additional Bitcoin scaling solutions, that should be the first question. I've now repeated this on like a couple of Twitter spaces as well. Um, the first question that you should ask are, what are the trust assumptions to get to get involved with this? Because the ugly truth of many of these other scaling solutions is people aren't being totally trustworthy with what you're actually taking on by getting involved in these ecosystems. And it's not to say that these things won't get safer over time. It's just that as of now, things like single sequencers with no fraud proofs are actually quite risky bridges. And we need to appreciate that and know that there's a path towards decentralization on some of these other ecosystems, but it's going to take time. And that's why Core really operates on like a measure three times cut once principle, because it's so important to earn that trust and to make sure that we provide the right offerings for all these folks. But I'll stop there. There's a whole bunch of other pieces that are in this vein, but we can't quite talk about them yet. And when I when I look at Bitcoin scaling solutions, I focus more on developer experience, user experience. And I think where, where Core is doing things right is you have Bitcoin as the base, and then you have EVM compatibility on top. So if a developer wants to come in, for, for them, it's a very easy experience to come in and build products in the ecosystem. And then from a user experience point of view, the throughput and the performance of Core is at par or even better than you know most recent uh, innovations in, in other blockchains. 
the problems facing, I would say, most of the current Bitcoin layer two or other scalability solutions out there is they've tried to figure out a scalability solution. They've got smart contract functionality. But if your finality takes 15 seconds and if it's a very costly transaction, then you're facing the same problem that ETH L1 does. And as we know, there's a reason why so many ETH L2s exist. So you need to solve for um, cost, you need to solve for throughput, you need to solve for uh, you know finality time, block times, slot times, uh, and all of that needs to be a priority when people look for scalability solutions. Otherwise, you may create something, but again, it's dead on arrival because users will not want to um, use that protocol, right? And, and why bridge an asset if bridging out costs me I don't know, hundreds of dollars and two weeks of, uh, you know, uncertainty. So all of that, all of those things, I think is are very important in any product which which goes to market and is live and is, is attempting attempting to do what Core is doing. And and I think you guys have been able to achieve that. So it, very exciting times. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful point there, Abi. And I want to jump into like Pitt's Pitt's kind of ex expansion or how you guys are thinking about Bitcoin, Bitcoin. but just to jump on the L2 point and like hand it to Rich here, there, there's a lot of talk about L2s as one of the scaling solutions. Seems like, you know, everyone was talking about L2s and, and, and they're coming soon. Where are we at with actual L2s? Cause it's important to note core is a, a letter one. So, so like, where, where do you think we're at with uh, L2s? And, and there seems to be a, maybe a bit of confusion with, uh, not confusion, but differences, or like maybe more, uh, you know, it's a bit wider on what an L2 is with Bitcoin compared to Ethereum. So just want to get your, your two cents on that. Yeah, so I'd say if we kind of like take a step back and say like, what are the two most popular variants of, of L2s? You've got ZK L2s, and then you've got optimistic rollups. Each has different interesting properties and has different assumptions that go into it, different waiting periods to, to uh, bridge out. There's all these different like trade-offs that, that you make based on the different L2 that you utilize. And in Bitcoin, the like kind of ugly truth at the moment is you really can't have a true L2 in the Ethereum sense because you can't do full proving on the Bitcoin base layer without additional opcodes getting added or something like BitVM becoming feasible. And there's a ton of research and development that's going on right now to be able to enable this sort of uh, technology to happen. But it's really difficult to want to implement these things. And then on the other side, to get approval from the Bitcoin core devs to be able to go take on more opcodes. There is some positive signs that this might happen this year, but TBD, I think maybe sometime in 2025 is a, is a better potential bet of when we'll, we'll see some of that stuff. But the key is until that happens, they don't really meet the, the test of what an L2 is. And the key property of L2s that are really important is unilateral exit. And the, the unilateral exit piece is if I think that a sequencer is acting Byzantine, I can force my funds to come back to me. I don't have to be at the mercy of a benevolent sequencer that decides to give me my funds back. And that's currently the, the state that we're in in the Bitcoin L2 space. And that's really challenging because now you're getting the trust assumptions again, which is something that Bitcoiners really hate. And, and that's kind of like people are borrowing the language of Ethereum L2s without the underlying promise and guarantees that you get of the Ethereum L2s. And, and I think that's where actually some of the, the folks from Bob are actually pretty interesting to build on Bitcoin folks because they actually are kind of like in this hybrid between uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum to allow themselves to get some of these guarantees. There's some other like interesting details to that relies on BitVM, which isn't live yet, like, but it's very novel from that point of view. And, and I think I, I really appreciate that viewpoint of like trying to get to the best uh, security posture for your users, because until we get there, the security model of a lot of these Bitcoin L2s is just trust me, bro. And, uh, and, and I don't think that's something that you want to bring real capital over to. One of the best memes by far. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, thanks for both. I, I think a uh, lot of good thoughts from both of you on the security side. Obviously, um, Abby on the on the Pith side, that's something you guys take really seriously by creating these like decentralized oracles, price feeds, and a bunch of other use cases. So, you guys have really blown up blown up this year. You've taken an approach where you're just integrating on on a ton of chains, which I think is 
been really interesting and, and awesome. Um, what, how are you guys thinking about BTC Fi or, or supporting Bitcoin, uh, whether it's through these EVM use cases like Core, et cetera, and what kind of uh, use cases can you enable uh, with Pith for developers? Yeah, I mean, so, so Pith, I think the way we designed our stack, we were prepared for a multi-chain, multi-layer world. That's what we were, um, that was our, you know, kind of true north in terms of our, you know, development work, to use that word again. Um, we are by nature chain agnostic. So we don't know and we don't really care as to who's going to win in terms of who's going to have most TVL or most activity. Our motto is to bring the best data to all of DeFi and hopefully we'll, you know, hit all the right nodes. So that's That's been the ethos of the PIT protocol. Um, in terms of our, you know, focus on on Bitcoin, last year we worked closely with the Hero team um, and integrated Pith on Stacks. That was our first kind of foray into the Bitcoin Fi space. But that started from us looking at the ecosystem and saying, "There's no way that this, you know, will not grow bigger." So we have to kind of focus our energies more into this space. And Core was the first one, and it was easier for us to work with you guys simply because, you know, A, you guys are great, but also it's like EVM compatible. Um, so it was more easier for us to integrate and faster as well. What I, I'm going to come back to what I mentioned previously is that because at Pith, we focus a lot on security. We focus a lot on performance as well. And you you don't want to have one or the other. You want to have both. That is the best user experience, in my opinion. And what we have seen from other you know solutions, not just in Bitcoin, but the other ecosystems as well, again, is that they're not able to solve for both. Or as Rich alluded to, some are not solving for either. Right? It's more like a trust me bro kind of an ecosystem. <laughs> so we we are more uh, we are definitely more bullish on ecosystems which are safe and secure, but also provide performance for users. Because I'm a big believer in you know user experience and putting customers first, putting their needs first. And I do think safety as well as performance are both the two pillars on which most users like choose where they want to go. So we've been working closely and I was at Bitcoin Renaissance as well last week at Denver and we saw all the energy. So I, I'm in touch with all the teams, which Rich also mentioned earlier. And, and some of them are mentioned in your in your light paper in, in unlocking Bitcoin DeFi. Um, so we're in touch with them and we want to support as many of them as possible. Um, and yeah, you know, we as a team are quite bullish on this ecosystem. As I said, there's one and a half trillion dollars worth of capital, which needs utility. And if people can find a way to get that, then there's no stopping this. This is three times all of Ethereum uh, value out there. So the potential is multiples of what exists today, right? Um, and that's the way we think about it. Yeah, and I, and I think just just to add on to that, I think uh, I think when you look at the potential opportunity size of like Bitcoin DeFi, Bitcoin at some point this cycle probably gets to like five trillion, four or five trillion, something like that. If ten percent of that or thirty percent of that comes in, like you're just talking like you know capital we've never seen before. And I think with that, it's also a great to, to call back to kind of Pith working with so many different amazing groups. This isn't going to be an N of one space. This is going to be a one event. There's going to be a lot of amazing projects here that get to amazing heights, and it's not going to be a winner take all dynamic. And that's also why I think the Bitcoin space is being so collaborative right now because people see how much opportunity there is. It's not zero sum. It truly is like a positive sum opportunity for all. Super helpful. So we've talked a bit about this, the you know, like size of the opportunity, why the time is right. You know, some of the the existing approaches uh, and how you know Pith is going to enable some of these use cases, but let, let's let's talk about some of the use cases 
on Bitcoin DeFi. Rich, I think you talked about some of the the more, you know, risk on approaches, right? There's non-custodial Bitcoin staking, which is coming on course consensus, which is probably the lowest risk, turns it into a yield bearing asset. And there's going to be people who want to do more. And we think that, you know, that's probably a, a really massive opportunity and, and kind of the, the thinking behind BTC Fi generally is these kind of next step use cases, which use cases are you most uh, excited about or, or thinking about when it comes to using Bitcoin uh, on chain and, and what, yeah, what are you excited about coming to core and just the, the Bitcoin ecosystem generally? So I'm never the prediction guy, uh, but I've given out like 15 predictions already uh, on this. Um, but, uh, but I think the biggest DeFi protocol we're going to see this cycle is going to be a Bitcoin MakerDAO, uh, hopefully powered by PIF, uh, living on core. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's going to be the biggest DeFi opportunity I've ever seen as like the first real foray before it spills over into like kind of a Cambrian explosion. And I think it's going to look like MakerDAO at first, and then it'll be a kind of evolving into like the first Bitcoin bank where you can actually, because Bitcoin is yield producing, you'll be able to use it for a variety of uh, safe investments. But when you think about like what Bitcoin holders want, they want to retain their Bitcoin because they want exposure to Bitcoin itself and they want to borrow dollars. And that's in a nutshell what Bitcoin MakerDAO would do. And I think there is a ton of demand for this. We speak with to the large Bitcoin holders and the large Bitcoin miners. And lots of these folks just want safe places to park, uh, to park their capital. And then also just to get leverage out on top of it. I think from there, you'll see some lending protocols get to some pretty interesting size, but those would be like kind of the least interesting from like a like risk pr perspective. But I think most ut uh, utility like driven home will be some of those protocols. But I, I think it'll get pretty wild on the uh, on the DeFi side in terms of some of the creative things that people come up with. But I think those would be my bets for like what are some of the huge winners uh, from in terms of like TVL and then also user winners in terms of like delivering real value to people, which is what crypto should be focused on at the end of the day. I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I think I'm 100% aligned on what, what Rich said. I'll take a different approach. I think this is definitely going to happen but what we might also see this cycle is, and that would be very interesting at least from a narrative point of view is you'll see institutions get involved and they will look to tokenize funds and launch them on blockchains why can't we have a bitcoin etf on chain for example uh you know and why can't it be custodied on chain held on chain traded on chain everything can be done via code um, and I think that would be an interesting for you. And I will not be surprised uh, if we see some very large institution experiment with that in the in this or the, or the coming year. That's interesting. It's like full cycle. So everything's on chain, then the ETF, and then the ETF on chain. It's like co comes back home. All, all roads come back to original Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of is a good point moving to kind of your thoughts on the next question, which is there's uh, been a lot of excitement with ETF, uh, a, a lot of buzz and awareness on Bitcoin. And, and then we've talked a lot about BTC Fi. So what do you think are the big unlocks uh, to getting more adoption on BTC Fi over the you know, coming year and, and, and couple of years as these use cases are, are actually coming live? Like what's going to be the key to getting Web2, Web3 users uh, involved in BTC Fi. I think like, um, as I mentioned before, for a lot of institutions, any foray, any investment into crypto starts and ends at Bitcoin, right? A lot of wealth managers only propose Bitcoin to their customers. The moment you can add on yield to it, you can add on some sort of staking utility, or put it in a deposit and you earn extra on top of it, um, that would just unlock so much more. Because today, Bitcoin is only a buy and hold passive kind of an investment for a lot of funds. The moment you can use it and generate extra yield on it and pass it on back to your customers and say, hey, as, as Rich alluded to it, not only are you holding the whole performance of Bitcoin, so you have exposure to that, but guess what? we're able to give you something on top of it and, and in using such a structured products or vaults, um, I think that'll be a great unlock. What I'm 
you know, very, very excited about is like, there is a lot of talent in the crypto ecosystem, which will migrate and come over to the Bitcoin ecosystem from, let's say, currently within Ethereum, uh, simply because they will see value as it's, you know, continues to get unlocked uh, in, in Bitcoin Pi landscape. So it would be very organic. And I don't think we'll, anybody will need to do much because the value proposition here, and as Rich mentioned, like it's a win-win. It's not a zero win, zero sum game. Everybody is going to be able to win here. So a lot of them will automatically migrate and, and you know, bring innovation into the space. So I, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Abby said, but I think I'm just focusing on like the, the retail perspective, potentially. Um, I think we have to build products and by we, I mean like the community, the builders out there, you need to build products that, that really add value to users at the end of the day. And I think we've seen with things like stable coins rapidly, you know, rapid growth and being a 10 to 100x better solution in a lot of ways, really kind of the power of, of bringing, you know, commerce on chain. I think one of the other big things, and that's just like storing your value in something that doesn't, you know, devalue against the dollar by, you know, five to 10% in any sort of, you know, short time frame. But I think the, the next wave is just simple, like yield accounts, spend accounts, where you're actually getting Bitcoin back and that sort of thing. Like, I don't think it needs to be the most complicated financial products. It just needs to be after like, the largest segment of you know users out there, which are Web two users, but there's six billion people out there, and I'm sure a very large percentage of that six billion would like to, as their dollars just sit there passively, start to earn Bitcoin in a trustless way. And I think we're going to see some of these like quote unquote reinventions of some like more boring technology from like a DeFi perspective, but that brings just a tremendous amount of real world utility. And that's one of the things that, that I'm really excited about because Core's goal is to build the most used blockchain. That's always what it's been. And we think that Bitcoin is the best avenue with which to go do that. And the rail of which to go do that is, is the core chain. So I'm you know, just super excited to watch some of these things get built out and deliver you know, real value to hopefully tens, hundreds, or billions of people. Love that. And especially with some of the use cases we talked about, there's a lot there. And, uh, and it kind of really evolving into the, the next level. I think we covered most of what we wanted to discuss today. Um, happy to open it up to any closing thoughts from each of you. If you feel we, uh, we missed anything or this is an important topic on, on Bitcoin and Bitcoin Fi that we want to touch on. But uh, yeah, is there anything else you guys want to cover together? Rich, you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to just give like just, just some closing uh, closing thoughts. Um, so one, thank you to all the Cortoshis that joined. We we love doing these things with you all, and you're always the the best guests. And there's always so much you know interesting kind of commentary and stuff that happens at the same time, both live and the replays on Twitter. Strongest community in all in crypto. We're, we're so lucky to be working on stuff that you guys use you know every day. Um, on the you know Bitcoin DeFi side, I think there's so many amazing releases that are coming out here in the very near future. Wrap Bitcoin should be out this month, and then we've got Bitcoin staking, which should be shortly after. And same with uh, HLC Atomic swaps. We are going to have some interesting news related to you know some additional Bitcoin DeFi pieces coming out not far from now as well. Trying to build this all-encompassing uh, home for BTC Fi. So it should be a really exciting exciting year. There's also been some interesting launches for some of the. Uh, the flagship protocols of the chain and those are always you know very cool to go check out but so many interesting things happen in the core ecosystem so thanks for being an amazing community and we're happy to keep bringing awesome stuff yeah and i'll run it up with just like reiterating that you know from our point of view it should be solely focused on enabling bitcoin fi um, we are definitely deploying resources in that direction we want to make that a reality um, and any builders out there who are looking to, you know, use Oracle feeds in their DeFi protocols, feel free to reach out and, you know, and, and discuss how we can power you and make you achieve your goals. Um, Pith is now with 470 plus price feeds. We're on 50 plus blockchains. I won't be surprised if we double both these metrics this year. Um, nice. so very, very explosive growth at Pith. Uh, 
but I am 100% sure Bitcoin, DeFi, and Core will be an integral part of it. Love it. I need Thanks like awesome. a fire emoji uh, for, yeah, I know. for we, doubling we're their, their amount of chains. Yeah. I mean, although there was, there's quite a few on the right here that you can see it's like keeps popping on the screen. Um, but no, it was, it was great to chat. Again, we were, it was great to kind of jump into some of the details and really discuss unlocking Bitcoin, uh, DeFi.com. So check out the paper there, but it was great to hear about Pip's bullishness in the space and, and supporting and investing. And then all the great releases and our approach here at core, uh, from rich. So thank you both. Uh, really exciting. Thanks to everyone who joined and check out the paper again at unlocking Bitcoin I think that's it y'all. Cheers. Thanks so much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks guys.